Thank you for listening to Mailbox Money, your guided tour through safe, sacred, and speculative investing with a plan and a purpose to do more good with newfound peace of mind. Welcome to Mailbox Money. My name is Ryan Kruger, and I am joined by my partner and my pal, Jackson Wood. And I am really looking forward to chopping it up with you more as my buddy today than as two professional portfolio managers, because we're going to keep our promise and open our whole playbook um, in every aspect of the world of investments and financial planning and advice. Well, part of that needs to include some real stuff. I call family stuff. Uh, us as dads, as friends, the, going through the trenches, quite literally, um, in some cases, and, and how our kids hear about this, how we heard about it as kids, if we did it all, and kind of open up and talk about, and maybe we'll, our community here will share some experiences. We love your comments. We love your, your questions. Um, I think this might be a sneaky underrated part of this whole topic of investing that we skip past too much. It, you know, we all have different relationships with money. And sometimes that leads to how we take it out on each other or the markets and have dysfunctions later on. And maybe even dare I say, blame the markets for too much or not enough risk taken. It all kind of goes back. We all have our origin stories. So I want to kick it off and how we learned to value money very differently. I mean, if, if you're digging a ditch and as a high school job to earn a little extra money like I was, and if that money was spent, lost, or invested, I can tell you it was a lot more agonizing to see those <laughs> movements knowing how many hours it took and where and how than had I been given that. Neither one of us had any distributions from trust funds coming, so we learned a different value of money early on. And frankly, as I look back, and as you and I have known each other for years now, it's probably one of the things that, that drew us together, similar experiences. We have very, very different backgrounds in different parts of the country, but we kind of look at and see the world and value hard work similarly, which, gosh, I think that's a huge piece of this puzzle. We're gonna talk about the very first job we ever had, the very first trade we ever had, and any of the messy middle in between, the very first entry we had into this industry. And so I'd ask you, my man, what your, your earliest memories of how you think you started to see and hear about or value money, if you can think back. You're a little bit younger than me, so it's a little easier for you. I had to, I had to do some digging. So I love it. So the, the earliest memory that I have about money I'm going to set the stage a little bit about kind of the, the situation I was in. I, I was being raised by a single mom who barely made it through high school. I, in fact, I don't even know if she made it through high school. I think so. But uh, she was a hairstylist and raising two kids. I remember we never had much money when, you know, at my mom's house. Um, I remember she would cash checks, physically cash them and, and you know, put you know, $20 bills and envelopes. And at the end of the month, I remember, you know, we didn't have money to have our cereal in the morning with milk. So it was, you know, cereal and water. And Cocoa Puffs taste a little different with water than with milk. Um, so from an early, early stage, like I realized, hey, when you get this, you know, money each month, it's important to spend it correctly. And, you know, there were months where we didn't spend it correctly and there were months when it you know it worked out so that framed my my mind as you know money can be like a very valuable tool to help you have a comfortable life but if there's not enough of it it can make life difficult and you know you're you're asking people for for money i remember i needed baseball cleats one year for for little league and and so we went to the pawn shop to, you know to sell stuff so i could get some cleats and uh, it just kind of set the stage where I, I felt kind of bad about that for, for quite some time, but through hard work and, and budgeting and, and dedication, you know, my mom somehow pulled it off. And, uh, you know, that really kind of set the stage for me to just kind of value money as, you know, as a necessary tool to make life comfortable. And I always, every time I buy cereal, I try not to buy 
sugary cereal for my kids. But every time I do, instead of getting the skim milk or the 1%, I always grab the whole milk with the red lid because I think, oh, look, if, if I had to have water, you kids are getting the full fat, full protein, you know, milk with your cereal. And uh, that from a very early age is just kind of how I framed money. And I've honestly had to untrain myself a little bit, you know, to have a little bit more flexibility with budgeting. But that that's kind of where I come from um, in my like immediate family situation. And, and I think that's a really good point about balancing. We've seen now that we do this on behalf of families and a couple of three generation families that we're blessed to work with and watching how I, I don't want to save up every gratification for somebody at the very end. I do want to see them enjoy it. But gosh, that balance in those early, early innings right. of truly valuing how hard it is to acquire money in the first place before we even worry about investing. And, and so I, I want to hear about those supper table talks. If you can think about it, it, did, did even the topic of investing or savings matter? Because back then, my, my parents, I mean, it was a rush to the bank just to save a little bit way before I ever heard about any investments. Um, but, you, you know, you mentioned cleats, and I think those are the first impressions we and now our kids, and we have eight about to be nine between us, so we can talk openly about every which, um, we, we got them from diapers to college. So if, if you want to lend an ear on how we think about investing, we even did an episode in investing with kids instead of for them. If you want to check that out, it was one of our funnest um, shows. But you, you mentioned cleats and my kids will roll their eyes and tell you when they talk about going to basketball camp and like a lot of kids in neighborhoods as, as comfortable as we're now blessed to be a part of. But then I always worry in the back of my mind, I was like, there is a huge advantage of discomfort. And I want to make sure we're not too comfortable because all the greatest success stories that we're around and the two of us looking at each other, examples of that started from discomfort. None of them started, none of them started from a place of too comfortable. So I try to keep that in mind. So they'll always remember and roll their eyes at hearing, well, you want to hear about the best kid that I ever went to basketball camp with? And before I got there, I thought it was going to be me, to be honest. But when I got there, it was the kid I saw outside with a rag and a solution that I later learned. He told me it was rubbing alcohol, and he was cleaning this super old pair of basketball shoots while these other kids that are kind of moaning and groaning and feeling like the camp was lucky to have them as they walked in with their new shoes. This guy was outside before he checked in cleaning with rubbing alcohol his old, old basketball shoes before he walked in that gym and carved everybody up. And I just think about how, how appreciative he must have been to be there and what went into that. And that same starting point and, and your perspective, no doubt has influence on your investment perspective and how you value money and how careful you're gonna be with it. Um, did, were those conversations, what were those very first investing, if at all, conversations um, that your hardworking mom, you either overheard her or anybody else? Um, I was the nerd who was actually reading about it in the newspaper for some weird reason. We'll get into that in a second of where I learned to arbitrage <laughs> and my first trade. But, but those earliest first conversations, what sticks out to you? So I'll be the first to say investing was never even discussed with my mom. What I learned from her was this uh, old school budgeting system with with envelopes. You know, you put your rent money in one envelope, you put your food money in one. And I remember specifically, you know, I thought it was the most money in the world. It had to be like $2,500 a month or something. And, you know, putting it into each envelope and then you've got this big stack of, you know, in a wallet. Um, my first experience with, uh, with investing, actually, I owe it to my fifth grade teacher. We had an investment tournament where, you know, you, you'd, get the, you'd get the newspaper and you'd look at the stock prices. And I'd managed to save up some allowance money and, uh, you know, for mowing lawns or doing chores around the house. And my mom didn't have an investment account, but my grandpa did. So I said, hey, I want to do this stock tournament you know, I just smoked everybody in my fifth grade class. I'm the champ, but I think I need to do this for real now. Uh, I want to buy a share of Sony. 
So I, I thought, I really want Nike and I want Sony, but I can't afford to buy both. I can't, you know, you have to buy one share. And so he said, oh, I'll call my broker. I gave him my allowance money. And then the next thing I get is the trade ticket that I had a share of Sony. And if I'm thinking back into the time frame, so, so he, to his credit, he actually did it for you. He didn't just take the money and say he was going to do it mythically. He did it for well, you? In his account, yeah. And, and he bought it for me. That's awesome. Um, you know, back in the day when you'd call and be like, hey, I need to get a couple shares of this. Hey, hey, he might have been a better grandpa than you realize. He may have paid $149 commission for that one share of stock. In fact, just to show you how this, that's pretty spectacular. Because we take for granted now, and we talked about one of our favorite custodians recently about how you can do fractional. You can start at any size, commission-free trades. Back then, that was a big deal. I mean, it could have been $800 if you wanted a 100 share trade. So kudos to your grandpa. Keep going. Yeah, so he was, he was where I learned investing in from fifth grade stock tournament, which I did win. I smoked everybody by luck of the draw. Um, way overpaid. You were hooked. Way overpaid for Sony. Had my single share of Sony um, in my grandpa's account. I can't, you know, I'm sure he paid a big fat commission, probably more than the stock cost. Um, but from that moment on, like every Sunday, I got the, I would get the newspaper and track my favorite ticker symbols. And I never had any money, so I never was able to buy anymore. But I built like a you know, paper portfolio. I learned about paper trading and I thought that actually meant like grab a yellow pad and you can write down, you know, track them up and down. And I did that for months and months and months at a time uh, until, you know, back in, until I got into high school and actually started making some money uh, in early days of college. But that was my first, my first foray into investing. And every time I had a question, I would go to him and, you know, say, what is this? How do he taught me mutual funds? He taught me stocks. He taught me, you know, portfolios. So I really owe it to him for kind of introing me into and having the patience to sit there, and, you know, and teach me about about markets. Hey, so in hindsight, there's a first clue. He didn't say, "Let's put this into some sort of fund," right? Or college savings that you can't see, but it'll be there one day. And just trust me, I'll take care of it for you. Um, and I'm sure you would have underestimated at the time, and that was your first, just like me, that was your, that's what you thought investing was. So all of a sudden, and to this day, fast forward a couple decades, you still are a stakeholder of companies where you see the name, you see the business in your own account. I don't think those two things are unconnected. I mean, I, I think you learned at an early age, I, very, very similar story to me too. So there's nothing wrong with those funds or 529s or savings plans, but you're never introducing the earliest and most transparent ways, win or lose, especially with one share, which you can do now. I think that's fantastic. It's funny you say, so fifth grade was when I got my first job before I learned knew anything about investment. I was actually begging my parents to work. And in fifth grade, and, and I can, I, and there's, there's another thing that's changed a lot. I mean, I had to ride my bike on what is, still to this day one of the busiest streets in houston texas and what and i think about that like what would you and i say to to our fifth grader who asked to do that today we got to be careful that we don't preclude them from some of these hard right. early lessons one of my favorites ever one of the greatest traders in the history of time george soros let his kid he made his kids find his their way home that's kind of before he went a little off the rails um <laughs> And he, he had a private security guard trailing. Them. They did not know this, but they had to find their way home to this crazy packed European street to see if they could figure it out, knowing there was a safety net underneath. But I think about that all the time. Are we, are we making sure we throw our kids in enough traffic with some precautions? Because brother, when I was pedaling my bike to that job that I had to beg them for, um, because it was at a baseball card shop and I was a huge baseball card nerd and I thought it'd be the coolest thing in the world to be surrounded by these all day and then and the owner thought it was really cool because I was applying for a job that I'm certain nobody else had ever asked for it was in the back of this windowless shop sorting thousands of cards all day long um, I think there's a lesson to there and that's right I really do think it's the work part first because what couple of bucks I would end up earning. It took me a long time. And I want to talk about with my kids at their supper table, where do we want to start working first? 
because that's going to ultimately to this day be the biggest ROI. If you find a craft that you really want to furiously pedal towards every day, the investment part second. It's it's the folks that put investing first that really don't like their job and they want the investments in the market to solve it for them early. That that's where dysfunctional relationships with money really start. So I'd like to talk about and show them first jobs before first investments. So I was lucky that they let me do it. Um, I learned a lot and I, I, I was a weird kid, admittedly. I was heavily biased towards this industry because I was a little weird to begin with. I was much more interested in the backs of the cars and the front and rooting for teams and players and jerseys and uh, the faces. I was like, man, look at these numbers. W what did I notice over these 10 years? Or if it was in really, really tiny font and it was an old player, it'd be like 30 years. And that's where I learned math. That's where I learned averages. It's also where I learned what I would now call trend following hey, yeah. or turns and pivots. I didn't know what, what that was then. Um, I, By the end of that summer, I also learned how to arbitrage. And my very first few, what I now know, were trades and what I was hardwired to do from my very first job to, to this day never having a resume professionally and you and I are going to talk about our entry in the industry here in a second but I realized that everybody that walked into that store had a hometown bias I learned over time that they had recency biases meaning whoever had just hit three home runs in two days oh my gosh let me get that card um, I also learned that if you married those two and went to another town, and back then I had to do a dial-up phone, I could buy a card for a nickel in Cleveland, Texas that would sell for 25 cents in Houston. If I bought 100 of those, <laughs> and of course, now again, my if, if, if your kid had boxes unmarked being shipped to the house <laughs> and you turned up with a little bit of cash, <laughs> would you worry or not? <clears throat> again, thanks to our parents for not having so much to worry about. That was my very first trade that I then, he let me have a table by the end of the summer. I took all of those profits and I bought my first rotisserie baseball team. It, now it's called fantasy baseball. And I thought, wow, this would be the coolest job in the world if I could run a team, which we now run, but they're tickers. Yeah, yeah. And as a fifth grader, I beat a country a little more impressive than your fifth grade one class. I, the whole national contest, I ended up winning the whole thing. <laughs> it was something huge, like $1,000. That's when I went to my dad, who I'd seen with those newspapers, and I say, how does the stock market work? I want to put 100% of my winnings. Yes. And I bought my very first shares. It was compact computer. A local, now here I am, I'm biased myself. It was a local hometown bias. I had to learn the hard way. Um, and I had my first stock trade after my first job in fifth grade and never looked back. I've been a baseball card and a stock market nerd ever since. Oh, I love it. I think there's something to that idea of kids allowing them to find their passion in riding your bike, sitting, I can't imagine how hot a windowless room in Houston, Texas would have been in the middle of the summer when you weren't at school but through the sweat and the magnifying glass looking at the back of the card. I mean, that's a transformative story. And uh, Compact Computer, how'd you pick that? You just saw? I, I think in hindsight, I have to give my dad a little bit of credit. He was no expert by any stretch, um, but I, in the background, I always heard him talking and he probably thought he was a stock picking genius. He didn't have that much money. I later learned, I, 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 we never, struggled and we did have milk for our cereal so that was a huge advantage i have over you but you have better hair so you grew up and you had that advantage with your with your mom um all i remember was when i woke up he was already gone i mean he, he worked and left to work had nothing to do with investments 4 30 in the morning so i knew how hard he had to work for what little he had and he definitely he, he just always said i want to make sure now my money's working as hard for me as i did for it so to his credit, we talked about it, and he probably said something positive about it, um, along with a lot of other, and he probably did what you and I've done with our kids, just a nudge, maybe here's a couple of companies to think about or talk about. Let's just talk about them at the supper table. I give 100% of credit to the fact, right or wrong, I'm sure there was some disastrous 
ideas that were tossed around there too. We at least talked about it at all. I think if anybody listening to this, you don't have to be a stock market expert. You don't have to read or listen to all the right, but if you at least talk about hard work and investing and whatever business it is you do know a little bit about and everybody listening to this, whatever it is, um, it doesn't have to be high tech. One of my favorite good old boys, sweat hogs from Louisiana, is like, all, all I know is this, this I, I clean pools and it's this pool company I work for and it's one of the best performing stocks <laughs> in my career. Like don't, don't be too worried about being too smart. Just look what's right around you to at least know how to make this sound interesting to a kid. And it was to me, um, it happened to work. So I got lucky there and I was hooked. I was hooked. Then I wanted more Then I wanted to devour it. I love it. I think there's another point there that you touched on briefly is everybody in today's uh, market would would say, oh, look, here's the best way to allocate with the lowest costs and the lowest expense ratios and diversification. That would have bored me to death and, and turned me off from the industry that I love. Had my grandpa said, here's a mutual fund with a lower cost, lower commission. Why don't you buy that instead of what you want to buy? And I don't even remember how what the market was doing back when I bought my first. But what he allowed me to do was to go through the, the process of my own idea. He helped me facilitate it, looking at it as a company. And from that moment, I loved the idea of investing. I could take my hard earned money and turn it into, I'm actually an owner. That's what really drew me to it, of Sony. Sony Entertainment, my TV in our living room was made by Sony. And to me, that was just like this magical connection of, okay, I get it. I wanna keep doing this for the rest of my life. And, and I, I think there's a little bit of hardwiring, certainly a lot of luck. We never underestimate the power of luck in all of our lives. We all hit the lottery uh, being born where we are in, in the toughest of circumstances in the United States, for sure. Um, but, but I do think, and I'll, I'll give a little credit to a, an investor in a different market that's done very well that I've learned a lot and I like a lot. Sam Zell said this the other day because um, he's talking about his early experience as a kid. And it could be a lot of things. It's not stocks, but he, he in his case, uh, it was a funny story that uh, I'll shorten for clarity and compliance sake of he found Playboys in some bus stop as a kid <laughs> that he took home. And, and he was, I think, a nerd too. Like he legitimately was talking about the articles and I tend to believe him, like, unlike most men. And he, he took it home and he had bought it for a dollar and somebody said, can I buy that from you for $3? There are certain kids who would either not sold it, heard that, laughed it off, or taken the $3 and that was the end of it. There are other kids who go back to the bus station, <laughs> get a hundred of them, and then go back home and have a pretty decent business. And that's, my, my story's a lot less colorful with a lot less picture pages, but that's what I did with those nickels to tournaments. Right. So the one thing he said that's worth listening to if you're a parent out there is, because they he kept pushing him on his secrets to success ever since. And he claims he's not the smartest guy in the world. And he said, the common theme throughout my whole career is no, I did everything in the world. Nobody ever told me I couldn't. So, and we think about that as parents, like even just not being told what you couldn't do in that particular case, I guess some parents would be horrified at that story. Um, his chose to not tell him he couldn't do it. And to this day, he says real estate deals, he does and starts new deals. And they talked about, he, he did something during a recession that nobody, it looks easy in hindsight. And they said, well, why didn't everybody, he's like, a lot of people would have seen it. Nobody told me I couldn't do it. So that is another common theme. Fast forward, brother, after you work all sorts of different odd jobs, like we both were blessed to learn the gritty discomfort from, when did you think, I might make a career out of investing. And how was that, those first early innings that led toward that first job for anybody listening that wonders about your backstory, the access to this industry, what it takes. I mean, I'm, there, there's other episodes where we, where, where I brag properly for you, but I mean, you're listening to a guy now who is one of the only active managers of a crypto digital asset portfolio at the end of the rainbow of the most complex of digital strategies. That's a long way from cleaning bathrooms at a theme park and one of your many colorful jobs, by the way. Um, that, that trajectory, you earned it all, you learned it all, 
you're to get credit for all of that and doing it at the highest level right now. But what about the very first time? If you either thought I'm confident, I'm good enough, or I'm not good enough, I'm worried. How did that first job or interview work out in the investment industry? So I, I worked my entire high school uh, career, I don't know if that's the right word, but my entire high school uh, four years for Murray City Power Company, power washing bathrooms and mowing lawns at substations for $6.90 an hour. My first paycheck, I spent my entire paycheck on a tank of gas just to get to work. And uh, from that moment on, I, I was fascinated by markets. I just said, you know what, I, I got to get more money. I might as well go to where the money is. I think I could do a good job. I don't want to be a lineman. I don't want to be climbing trees with a chainsaw. I don't want to be bullied by these guys at the power company anymore. I got to get I got to get to college. And by the way, th thank you for proving, I don't mean to interrupt, but thank you for proving my point that this is so accessible. Even somebody at that age and as smart as you are now, you're cash flow negative. <laughs> at your, your, your job, and, and now you're making me feel good. You're, maybe I'm, I, I was 500% profit margin in fifth grade, so I, I'm, I'm ahead of you already. I'm enjoying this story already. Your cash flow negative, go from there. And how you've ended up here is amazing to me now. So I still, could, I, I still kept that job actually into, uh, into college. And uh, I, was, I was like the grunt. I was bullied around. I remember the guy <laughs> took a Slurpee out of his you know, big uh, power truck and he threw it onto the ground and he yelled, hey, Wood, go pick it up, that's your job. And I just put my head down and walked over and picked the Slurpee up and put it in my garbage bag and thought, I'm gonna do whatever it takes so that one day I'm the person that's controlling the money and, and I don't have to do this anymore. And I don't wanna treat people how that guy treated me. But I'll thank him today, I'll shake his hand and say, you taught me a lesson. So I'm in college, still working that part-time job. I become obsessed with Bitcoin. And my second ever trade was buying Bitcoin. So Sony, Skip the rest of my career because I never had any more money. I drove a truck and that took all my gas. One of a kind from one share of Sony to Bitcoin. This is one of a kind. And the, the way you used to buy Bitcoin, I'll tell this really quickly because it's so easy now we take it for granted. You had to go to Walmart. You had to send a money order from Western Union or MoneyGram to a company called ZipZap. And then ZipZap would then send your money after a couple of weeks to this company called BitInstant, which is on New York. And you had to fill out these forms along the way and you wire money and then uh, bit instant would after like maybe four weeks deposit bitcoins into your exchange account in a company called mount gox and it was like an eight week long ordeal just to see your bitcoins and so from that i just started becoming obsessed with economics with financial markets and so i needed an internship uh for my economics degree so i applied for um, I applied for an internship with Fidelity Investments. Little did I know that my obsession of while I'm pressure washing bathrooms and mowing lawns on the weekends, I was listening to podcasts and learning about this. And so when I got into the interview for an internship, they ended up at the end of the interview saying, why don't you come on as one of our traders and we'll train you. You can take your Series 7 exam, all these different exams, we'll pay for your college, we'll, we'll have a flexible schedule. Um, you know, it, and it just like, I was like, whoa, and my starting salary was going to be like eight years worth of, you know, Murray City Power wages. And I was just like fascinated, like I can do this. And so I was on the trading desk for no longer than just a couple of months before I said, yeah, I want to talk to people about this. I want to build portfolios. And so I've been an advisor and doing that ever since. And Bitcoin has been right alongside my investment portfolio or in my investment portfolio. I can't say it beat trad five traditional finance because i have that sony stock and now that i think about it i think my grandpa still holds it but i love the idea of it being in his account still more than being in my account just because of the memories um but that was my intro and it's been you know was at fidelity for quite a while before i left and went on my own and then linked up with you and now bitcoin is part of a portfolio and it, it still blows my mind that that idea i i read about in 2012 is an emerging asset class that people are taking serious. It's just, it's just kind of a fulfillment for me. It feels great. Well, I, I had lunch yesterday, and probably what spurred the idea of, hey, I got an idea. Let's go in completely back and forth. We haven't talked about this topic. Let's have this show on our origin stories. The guy that I give all the credit in the world to hiring me, um, especially after I had to convince him um, when he said I'm not interviewing you. That was quite a 
a leap to start a career and getting hired when the answer to can I have an interview was no. Um, but but the common theme since then and what brought us together and any investor or, or, or anybody looking for any partner out there in any profession, find a craftsman that is obsessed with his work, that feels lucky to do the work. Um, we've never wanted another job since then. Right. My, my, you know, the barroom trivia on me that you always get a giggle out, so I'll share it. Uh, it's not terribly impressive, but I still to this day have never had a resume in my life. And the reason, the very short uh, version of that gritty, uncomfortable story was when I asked and I could not wait to start my hunt for a Wall Street job, I was simply told no. I couldn't even interview. Um, this is 1996. And begging is not quite the right word. I, I prefer to call it a Hail Mary letter that I wrote for just a visit in lieu of an interview. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I figured if I could just get through that door and talk to somebody, they would have to carry me out um, or, or security back then, which probably was a pretty decent option for them at the time. Um, and I just kind of in my own mind was going to refuse to leave. And I took that visit into a starting position in the mailroom. One of the many reasons we affectionately call this mailbox money, which we have fast forward. I left Wall Street as a senior portfolio manager, believe it or not. I never wanted another job. I never applied for another job. So I never actually had a resume. I didn't have to produce it to the first because I didn't have an interview. Um, and here we are 26 years later. Um, we look forward to sharing every page of that playbook and that journey. We wanted to throw this look back for a couple smiles. Um, for us, anyways, if any listeners or any new subscribers want to join us for that journey, we can't wait to share every single topic we've learned, some like these the hard way, um, and share it all. And if you have questions or comments, um, we are professional guides and we have a team here. We can answer those. Or if somebody's trying to do this themselves, we want to share every page to let you experience all those twists and turns that we have. Um, we can definitely save you a lot of time and cut out a lot of the noise and distractions. And we will look forward to doing it all again next week. Thank you for joining us. This show is brought to you by Freedom Day Solutions, LLC, a registered investment advisory firm advising individuals and families nationwide. Performance is not guaranteed and past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. To learn more, visit freedomdaysolutions.com. This show contains general information that is not suitable for everyone and was shared for informational purposes only. Any forward-looking statement or opinion expressed is subject to change without notice. Nothing contained herein constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice, nor is it to be relied on in making investment or other decisions. Clients of Freedom Day Solutions may hold positions in the securities discussed.